Okay, good morning. This is Mark Arnold, Senior Vice President of Marketing with Zap Surgical. Welcome and thanks for joining us today for a webinar as part of the Fall SRS webinar series. The Fall lineup does include 11 talks over 11 weeks, so if you haven't already, I do encourage everyone to visit the fall.srs-webinars.com website to review our final upcoming talk, which is next week, as well as the previous nine talks. And through this website, you can register to view recordings of the prior webinars as well. So one last item of business before we get started. If you'd like to submit any typewritten questions at any point during today's talk, you can do so by using the Q&A button found at the bottom of your Zoom console. And time permitting, your questions will be addressed by Dr. Meta at the end of today's presentation. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. John Adler. Dr. Adler is the CEO and co-founder of Zap Surgical, inventor of the CyberKnife robotic radio surgery system, and professor emeritus of neurosurgery and radiation oncology at Stanford University. Dr. Adler. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world today. So it's a, a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Manesh Mehta, who, if you don't know him, he's been a fixture on the radiation oncology, radio surgery world for the last uh, three decades, I would say. Um, he is kind of world renowned in radio surgery, proton therapy, cancer research in general. Uh, he hailed originally from uh, University of Wisconsin where he did his residency. He was later chairman of the medical school department of human oncology there and has headed its brain tumor program for more than 15 years. Uh, he's had national roles in clinical trial research and design. Um, and uh, my understanding is he's still chair of the NRG and RTOG uh, Brain Tumor Committee. Um, I've watched uh, Manesh with great, uh, can't say pride because I had nothing to do with it, but with just uh, sheer enthusiasm for his career. He's published more than a thousand articles and uh, has contributed immensely to the field of radio surgery, in particular with regard to brain tumors and brain tumor treatment. Um, and uh, my understanding is he's currently Deputy Director and Chief of Radiation Oncology of Miami Cancer Center at Baptist Health uh, South Florida, uh, which is really a huge, huge, uh, I think, operation when it comes to modern, uh, modern cancer care and especially radiotherapy. And uh, so, uh, so delighted that welcome this morning. And uh, Manesh is going to be speaking about emerging trends in brain tumor therapy. And I'm not sure we'll have something to learn here. Welcome, Manesh. John, thank you, thank you so much. We are uh, both in the mutual admiration club, and I'm going to start by uh, sharing my screen uh, so that you can see that. Let me make sure that everybody can see my screen first. Is my screen visible? Can somebody confirm that? Yes, it looks perfect. Perfect. So I was assigned what is probably one of the most uh, um, complicated, uh, by the way, do you see the full screen or do you see a split screen? See a split screen right now, or see your next slide. Let me switch that around so that you're seeing the appropriate screen. Is this better? Uh, yes, perfect. All right. So I was assigned what is probably uh, one of the more challenging topics because it has no beginning and no end, which is the emerging trends in brain tumor therapy and everything is always emerging. So this is sort of a boundaryless talk, which also kind of makes it fun. I'll start with one of my favorite slides, which when John is at the other end, I really, really love to show. And that's the conflict of interest slide. And for those of you who don't know, the most famous quote I've ever heard about conflict of interest comes from John, which is, if you have no conflict, I have no interest. And I love that particular statement. I think that is um, a very wise statement. So my focus today is going to be to broadly outline a few themes in terms of emerging trends in brain tumor therapy. These are themes that span the fields of surgery, radiotherapy, systemic therapies, precision guidance and personalization. And obviously I will not be able to cover the ground in all of those themes, 
So I'll focus a little bit more on some and just skim through others just to give you a flavor that there's a lot happening in the world of brain tumors. So let's start with surgery first. What are some of the key things, and this is obviously only a partial list of some of the emerging trends in brain tumor therapy for surgery. Advanced imaging is now better defining how we resect tumors through functional guidance, through tumor definition, with things like 5-ALA guided resection. We now have data, for example, from a very intriguing recent paper that even extending the resection in glioblastoma into the non-enhancing portion of the tumor, i.e. the flare portion of the tumor, actually results in superior overall survival. This is actually a dramatic finding. This is the first time we've shown such a finding. We know that this is something that the French have uh, demonstrated to us in the past in lower grade gliomas, but, but seeing this trend in newly diagnosed glioblastoma is a unique and first finding. So advanced imaging is gonna be crucial in terms of more complete resection, which we believe now increasingly has evidence for improved survival. Advanced technologies such as LIT, for example, are revolutionizing the extent of surgery, the extent of ablation that we can carry out, and is uh, blurring the borders between resection for tumor and resection for radionecrosis, for example. So these technologies are beginning to find a place now increasingly even in the newly diagnosed context. Let's not forget things like improvements in neuroanesthesia, which are so critical in the recovery phase, minimizing the impairment in terms of functional outcomes and quality of life in patients, and therefore maximizing these endpoints. And neuroanesthesia has a considerable uh, impact on what happens to patients in the modern day and age. Similarly, advances in neuro ICU recovery and rehab have had dramatic improvements. I can speak to this very personally. A year ago, my mother was hospitalized for 21 days on a neuro ICU from an intracranial bleed at age 87 from a ruptured aneurysm. And I slept every night in the neuro ICU and I was impressed and amazed at the skill and uh, quality improvement in neuro ICU uh, care of patients. This I think is a dramatic improvement that often goes under record the impact of gross total resection has now been realized. We know this from supra-radical resection in low-grade gliomas. Dr. Dufour from France, controversial as he may be, has probably set the stage in this context. And as I mentioned earlier, this concept is now extended to high-grade gliomas. And obviously, a key issue regarding surgery is tissue. And we need tissue for molecular profiling, which has now essentially become routine in the world of gliomas and in the world increasingly of non-glial uh, brain tumors as well. In terms of systemic therapeutics, there are a number of advances. Uh, we now have a number of blood-brain barrier penetrating agents. Perhaps the best examples of these are in the context of metastatic disease, but these agents are now producing dramatic intracranial responses, something that we had not seen just five to seven years ago. We now have technologies such as HIFU, or blood-brain barrier disruption. This is clearly experimental, but this could allow greater drug concentrations, permeability and penetrations into tumors on the other side of the blood-brain barrier. The molecularly targeted agents with examples spanning from inhibitors of BRAP, HER2, EGFR, and agents targeting craniopharyngioma, for example, are now all agents that penetrate the blood-brain barrier and produce dramatic and effective responses. Uh, we haven't learned how to appropriately combine these with our existing therapies, but we are all excited about the kinds of responses that we see from these agents. Agents that don't necessarily need to cross the blood-brain barrier, such as immune checkpoint inhibitors that target, for example, hypermutant tumors, melanoma mets, increasingly renal cell mets, non-small cell lung cancer, and even certain glioblastomas, for example, germline defective glioblastomas, are being treated with these immune checkpoint inhibitors showing very impressive responses. Everybody knows the story of President Carter with his melanoma brain metastasis with multi-year high quality survival uh, as a consequence of being treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. So this is clearly a revolutionary um, uh, progress in our field of systemic therapeutics. Of course, what's next is things like vaccines, CAR T cells, et cetera. And these are just scratching the surface at this point in early clinical trials. In terms of radiotherapy, where the focus of my talk is going to be, I selected four areas of emerging trends. I could have selected far more, but in the interest of time, these were the areas I selected. 
And these include the impact of advanced imaging on the field of radiotherapy, on the broader and increasing applicability of radiosurgery, on molecular guidance for dose selection, and on smart combinatorial therapies. So I'll take each of these domains. I'll speak a little bit to that. I'm probably not gonna spend much time on molecular guidance because this is a, a very, very emerging field with very modest amount of data. So I'll just give you a glimpse of it, but we won't spend too much time on that domain. Let's start first with advanced imaging. Uh, I'm gonna show you two examples, Im examples in the role of uh, primarily functional guidance to improve radiotherapy outcomes. And in this context, I'm going to select the example of hippocampal avoidance, just because this happens to be uh, an area that I've worked in and an area for which we are now getting increasing and impressive clinical trial results. So what do I mean by this? Let's start by taking a look at this particular clinical trial, which is known as the NRGCC001 clinical trial. This was a phase three randomized clinical trial in patients with brain metastasis who would be stratified by the RPA or classification in terms of prognostic variables and prior therapy, and then randomized to whole brain radiation with the neuroprotective drug memantin, which in an earlier trial had shown neuroprotective benefit, plus the same arm, except with a tweak that the whole brain radiotherapy would spare the perihippocampal region where stem cell neurogenesis is responsible for producing new cells that are responsible for memory functions. So the idea was that sparing this neurogenic domain of stem cells would potentially spare memory. So patients were randomized to this trial with the endpoint primarily being baseline uh, neurocognitive functional testing, which would be repeated over a period of several follow-up visits to determine if there's a difference between the two arms in terms of neurocognitive function. The results are shown here. The whole brain radiotherapy plus memantin, memantin arm is on top, which means that they have worse neurocognitive functional outcome as compared to whole brain radiation with memantin delivered with hippocampal avoidance. And if we look at the actual numbers on the left-hand side of this slide, and if we look at what happens at six months, for example, in the whole brain arm, uh, more than two thirds of the patients, about 68.2% of the patients experience cognitive functional failure. And this improves by approximately 10 or 11% with the addition of hippocampal avoidance. Hazard ratio on this was 0.76, which implies approximately a 24% improvement in the endpoint with a very strongly positive p-value. Uh, in fact, what do these results mean? Let's put these in the context of some of the other trials that have used similar endpoints. So there is a trial called N0574, which I'll talk about in a bit again, but this is a trial that used stereotactic radiosurgery alone on the control arm and stereotactic radiosurgery plus conventional whole brain radiation on the experimental arm. And in the control arm, which is radiosurgery alone, uh, cognitive functional failure at six months was 64%, which is actually quite similar to what you see with whole brain radiation and memantin and significantly worse than with hippocampal avoidance. So what's really intriguing to understand here is that even with technologies such as SRS, a significant majority of patients, almost two thirds, experience cognitive decline over time due to multifactorial reasons, but this can also still be improved with the addition of hippocampal avoidance. And we'll get to the N0574 data in a little more detail in a bit. Now, the other domain where advanced imaging has had an impact on the management of brain tumor patients, particularly from the perspective of radiotherapy, is in contouring better, more accurate contouring of tumors is now possible with advanced imaging. For example, in Europe, PET is approved for contouring meningioma. This is something, uh, uh, gallium dotted PET, for example, is something that we don't routinely use in the US, but is routinely used in Europe for contouring meningiomas. In Europe, there are clinical trials looking at amino acid PET imaging for glioblastoma contouring, again, something that is not widely used here in the United States. But what is becoming more commonly used in the United States, at least in the perspective of clinical trial domains, is the use of perfusion and diffusion weighted MR imaging for contouring glioblastoma. Does this really make a difference? These are recent data from the group at the University of Michigan that has done a lot of work in this particular domain of looking at perfusion and diffusion weighted imaging. And in fact, they have shown very categorically 
that this combinatorial imaging uh, yields the highest prediction of progression-free survival and has the greatest spatial overlap with eventual tumor recurrence. So if we look at the slides, if we look at the images, the five images at the bottom of this slide, what we can see very clearly from the perfusion and the diffusion weighted MR imaging in image number three on the bottom panel is the composite target outlined in red, which would be the high risk area of glioblastoma in this particular patient. Image number four shows the recurrence in yellow. And if you look at the overlap in image number five, the overlap largely predicts the area of relapse or recurrence. So clearly diffusion and perfusion imaging very clearly with very strong association identifies where the ultimate recurrence is going to occur. But what's intriguing is if you now score this and look at it carefully, perfusion and diffusion imaging identifies tumors outside the enhancing region about 40% of the time. And if one were using very tight margins with radiation, this would have been missed by radiotherapy. And what's even more intriguing is not everything that enhances is abnormal on diffusion and perfusion imaging. In fact, the diffusion perfusion imaging volume is typically one and a half times to two times smaller than the enhancing tumor, suggesting that perhaps we could use this to run clinical trials to identify what is the best way of contouring and targeting. Of course, all we know right now is we have different results from the different modalities, but whether actually implementing this in a clinical trial would change the outcome of patients remains to be seen. The second domain that I want to talk about is the explosion in, radiotherapy, in, in radiosurgery in particular. And given that this talk is sponsored by ZAP, that is an appropriate domain to talk about because that is exactly what this technology does. It provides an elegant solution for radiosurgery and so where is the field of radiosurgery moving? Particularly when it comes to brain metastasis, there has been a dramatic shift. We started off with one metastasis being treated with radiosurgery, increased that front line to about three to four, and then up to 10, and now many would say as many as feasible, that there is no upper limit. So why is this happening? What is driving this? In large measure, clinical data have driven this adoption and technology has facilitated this trend. I do have an intriguing question that was posed to me in one of my other talks, and that is whether the alternative payment model in radiation oncology will get in the way of this explosion of radiosurgery, and that's a very intriguing question that we'll try and address in the Q&A session, time permitting. But one of the other things I do wanna show you is that radiosurgery explosion is occurring not just in the context of clinical data and technology, but now increasingly with the advent of artificial intelligence. I'll show you an example of that in a bit. So let's first look at the clinical data that are fueling this explosive growth in radiosurgery. Uh, many, many years back, the publication that came out in 2000 from RTOG, RTOG 9005, established the dose guidelines for radiosurgery. That was almost 20 years ago. The trial was conducted prior to that. So the trial was conducted a quarter century ago, if you really think about it. 9508, which was also an RTOG trial, was the first, and in fact, the only trial that ever established a survival advantage for patients with brain metastasis treated with radiosurgery. The survival was limited to patients with one brain metastasis. This was published in the Lancet 15 years ago in 2004. More recent trials, such as the Intergroup N0574 trials, provided the impetus for using this in up to three to four brain metastasis. But this was not on the basis of an improvement in survival. There was in fact no improvements in, in survival with the use of radiosurgery in place of hormone radiotherapy, but there was a significant improvement in neurocognitive decline. So it was a functional endpoint that drove the adoption into three, in three to four brain metastasis. The Japanese trial by Yamamoto published five years ago in Lancet increased the frontier to about 10 metastases. And this year, Jing Li from MD Anderson presented initial results of their clinical trial up to 15 brain metastases, essentially showing the same endpoint, i.e. neurocognitive functional status is better preserved with radiosurgery compared to radiosurgery plus whole brain radiation in patients now with up to 15 brain metastases. This is the original trial, the granddaddy of them all, RTOG 9508, still the only one that ever showed a survival benefit. And this is the survival benefit 
in the darker curve up top, radio surgery plus stereotactic radio surgery, compared to radiotherapy alone in the dashed curve at the bottom. The curve is consistently positive in favor of radio surgery. So the addition of radio surgery to whole brain radiotherapy produced an improvement in survival, which by pre-trial definition was limited to patients with single brain metastasis. But on post hoc analysis of the trial, which was an unpreplanned post hoc analysis, patients with more than one brain metastasis, but with a high functional status measured using the RPA score also show an improvement in survival. The hypothesis that starts emerging from this is if you have a patient that has a reasonable likelihood of having their systemic disease controlled so that they do not die of extracranial progression, but are at risk of dying of intracranial progression, then controlling the intracranial disease with the addition of radiosurgery to whole brain radiotherapy in 9508 produced a survival benefit. Along came N0574, the trial that expanded the reach in patients up to three brain metastases and flipped the question. So now instead of asking the question of the addition of whole brain radiotherapy to stereotactic radiosurgery, the question was, what if the control arm was stereotactic radiosurgery alone and the experimental arm was stereotactic radiosurgery plus whole brain radiotherapy, would there be a difference? And the burden of proof was placed on the stereotactic radiosurgery plus whole brain radiotherapy arm to A, show a survival improvement, which it did not, and B, to demonstrate whether stereotactic radiosurgery alone would produce superior cognitive function. And the trial rationale was that whole brain radiotherapy was, would cause more cognitive dysfunction, which was actually very well known at that time. The investigators created the entry hypothesis that the well-known cognitive dysfunction rate of about two thirds of patients, i.e. about 65% by three months was unacceptable. And that the use of radiosurgery should lower this to perhaps less than 50% with a 0.4 being an acceptable rate. So this was a study hypothesis that whole brain radiotherapy would produce cognitive decline in about two thirds of patients, 65% by three months. Stereotactic radiosurgery would diminish this to about 40% by about three months. And this was in fact the defined goal of the study. So this is what actually happened on the trial. Uh, as expected, the addition of whole brain radiotherapy did not add to a survival benefit that was not seen. This is now a recurrent theme. We've seen this again and again. And when we look at multiple brain metastases, more does not yield higher overall survival. However, whole brain radiotherapy clearly and negatively affected cognition more than radiosurgery did. The three-month cognitive progression rate with whole brain radiotherapy was 88% compared to 62% with stereotactic radiosurgery alone. That's a delta of 26%, a 26% improvement in cognition by avoiding whole brain radiation. But the price that one pays for this, because nothing in life is free, is an increase in intracranial failure. And that increase in intracranial failure is in the magnitude of 34%. It's a larger magnitude than the magnitude of benefit of cognitive functional preservation. By 12 months, uh, almost 50% uh, of the patients on the stereotactic radiosurgery arm had relapsed whereas on the stereotactic radiosurgery plus whole brain radiotherapy arm, that was only in the order of about 15%. So a very large delta in favor of the addition of whole brain radiotherapy. So unquestionably, whole brain radiotherapy clearly and negatively affected cognition, but radiosurgery also negatively affected cognition in almost two thirds of the patients, 62%. Remember the study hypothesis was 65% from whole brain is unacceptable. We should lower it down to about 40% with radiosurgery, which we actually failed to achieve in this trial, but still the delta was large enough that the trial came out to be statistically positive. So clearly this is now showing us that whole brain radiotherapy produces cognitive decline in a substantial majority of patients and stereotactic radiosurgery helps. The price of course is intracranial control. The largest trial in patients beyond three metastases is actually a retrospective review. This is an eight institution experience that was published in 2019, where they treated patients with up to 15 brain metastases. The recent trial by Jing Li at Astro this year now provides us randomized data in this context. But prior to that, this was the only large database 
in patients with up to 15 brain metastasis. This included over 2,000 patients, uh, almost 1,989 had one met, 882 patients had two to four mets, and over 200 patients had up to 15 brain metastasis. There are a few very intriguing observations that come out of this eight institution experience. The first is the median survival information. The median survival is almost 15 months in patients with single brain metastasis. It dips down to just under 10 months in patients with up to four brain metastases and dips down to seven and a half months for patients with five or more met brain metastases. So there is no question that survival is a function of lesion number. This is an important point because it is frequently stated that survival is not a function of lesion number, but it actually is. If one looks at series that are big enough, you do actually see the impact of lesion numbers. And that makes sense. More disease is a biological imprint of more aggressive disease. And it's not surprising that these patients have inferior outcome. What's also interesting is that the distant brain failure rate also increases from 30 to 40 to 50% as the number of brain metastases go up. And this can be measured as a function of the velocity with which relapse occurs. So if you look at the brain failure rate and you put the variable of time into it, you can create an element known as brain metastasis velocity, which is illustrated as the last row in this table, BMV. And if we look at the brain metastasis velocity, it is about four in patients with one brain metastasis and reaches almost 12 in patients with more than five brain metastases. So these patients with multiple brain metastases fail in the brain often, frequently, and again and again. It's like the elections in Chicago, vote often and vote early. And so these patients do fail quickly. So survival and brain failure are therefore both a function of lesion number. A new trial, this is a Canadian trial, CE.7, is evaluating stereotactic radiosurgery for this group of patients, patients with up to 15 brain metastases. And these patients, after stratification by their prognostic index, the disease-specific graded prognostic assessment score, as well as other stratification variables, are randomized to the control arm of radiosurgery or the experimental arm of whole brain uh, radiotherapy with hippocampal avoidance and memantin with the hypothesis being that these patients would fail in the brain so often that perhaps the whole brain radiotherapy is a necessary component uh, of their treatment. The trial requires 206 patients, 36 have been enrolled. Uh, the trial is currently enrolling. My biased opinion is that the experimental arm should really have been stereotactic radiosurgery plus hippocampal avoidance plus memantin because the purpose of hippocampal avoidance is really to control microscopic disease in the brain and lower the rate of cognitive decline, which Memantin helps with. And the purpose of radiosurgery is to achieve and optimize local control of all macroscopic disease in the brain. And so if I were to redesign this trial, the experimental arm would have included radiosurgery. Now let's go back to the trial I started with, which was RTOG 9005, which is really a trial of radiation dose. And the reason this is important is because as the practice of radiosurgery is growing and exploding, there is a lesson from this trial that we are moving away from, and that is the lesson of dose. This trial clearly established that safe doses were about 24 gray for lesions less than 2 cm, 18 for 2 to 3 cm, and 15 for 3 to 4 cm. And often as we treat more and more and more brain metastasis, we are approaching not the MTD, but the DCP. The DCP is the doctor chicken point. What dose do I chicken away from when I see more and more lesions and give a lower and lower dose? So there is this increasing fashion of lowering the radiosurgery dose. Is that safe? Can we get away with that? Well, let's look at some very old data. These were data we published back in 1992, and you can see the legacy quality of the publications and the images back then. Uh, but this was an attempt at looking at tumor response following radiosurgery as a function of size. The top curve shows overall response, which is both complete and partial response. The bottom curve is complete response. As you can see very clearly, the complete response rates dramatically drop as tumor diameter increases. 
And this is best illustrated by converting this figure into looking at tumor diameter by centimeter. So one centimeter tumor diameter, one gets almost a 60% CR rate and 80% CR plus PR rate. When you get to one and a half CM, just a five millimeter increase, the CR rates start dropping to about 55%. With two CM, the CR rates drop to about 40%. With two and a half CM, the CR rates drop to about 20%. With three CM tumors, the CR rates drop to about 15%. And with three and a half CM tumors, the CR rates drop to about 10%. So very steep and dramatic decline in complete response rates, but a corresponding decline in overall survival rates as well. For lesions three to three and a half CM in size, overall response rates are less than 60% with radiosurgery used at full dose as identified by the RTOG 9005 trials. And lowering the dose further is not going to win us any friends in terms of overall local control. It's only going to decline this further. So how do we solve this conundrum of giving a safe dose to large tumors? Here is another piece of data published in 2015, which actually shows very clearly that large metastases are associated with a very high failure rate. There are four curves on this slide. The curve with the worst failure rate is salvage gamma knife radiosurgery. So patients previously had brain metastases, they came for salvage, and uh, the failure rates are approaching 25 to 30% in these patients by six months. If one looks at uh, surgery plus gamma knife radiosurgery, the 12-month local failure rate is about 21%. With gamma knife radiosurgery, the 12-month failure rate is 20%. And with gamma knife radiosurgery and whole brain radiotherapy, the 12-month local failure rate is about 6%. So even with gamma knife radiosurgery, the addition of whole brain radiotherapy dramatically decreases the 12-month local failure rate, and it is a function of size. So we need to be thinking about how do we improve our local control rates with radiosurgery alone in these patients with larger metastatic lesions. And one of the approaches that we have used here at my institution is something we published in 2018, and that is the use of hypofractionation as well as staged SRS. And so as an example, let's take a tumor that's between um, three to four centimeters in size. If one were to treat this with a single fraction radiosurgery dose, it would be approximately 15 gray. And that is going to be inadequate in terms of producing durable and sustained local control. With hypofractionation, we would treat such a tumor to 27 to 30 grain, three to five fractions. And if we were to do staged SRS, we would deliver 15 gray, wait approximately three to four weeks, and then deliver a second fraction of 15 gray with repeat imaging. And we believe that such an approach, and there are now emerging data, A, produces greater safety, and B, not yet proven, but appears to increase the overall control rates. These data are still preliminary, but an increasing body of data is beginning to suggest that. So maybe stereotactic radiosurgery having arrived is now emerging into more than one fraction, at least for select patients using maybe three or three to five fractions. When we look at the context of post-operative use of stereotactic radiosurgery, the intergroup trial led by Alliance N107C also known as RTOG 1270, asked the question in patients post-resection whether there would be a difference between stereotactic radiosurgery alone to the tumor bed or whole brain radiotherapy and stereotactic radiosurgery, uh, or, or sorry, whole brain radiotherapy with stereotactic radiosurgery being given to intact brain metastasis on both arms. Again, this particular trial showed no difference in overall survival between the two arms. The curve in blue on the left panel of this image is stereotactic radiosurgery. The curve in gold is whole brain radiotherapy. So although there is no difference in overall survival, do notice that for about a third of the survival period, the whole brain radiotherapy arm continues to function better. Uh, it's not statistically significantly different, but this is an observation that's worth keeping in mind given the relatively small size of the trial. What's really crucial and important are the data on the right-hand side of this slide. And these clearly show the value of stereotactic radiosurgery in the postoperative context, showing that cognitive deterioration-free survival is superior with stereotactic radiosurgery 
compared to whole brain radiotherapy. So clearly radiosurgery preserves cognition better than whole brain radiotherapy does. That's the good news. But here's the bad news. Let's look at the six month cognitive deterioration free survival. For whole brain radiotherapy, that's under 10%. For stereotactic radiosurgery, it's only about 20%. So in the post-operative context, stereotactic radiosurgery is better, but it's not superb. So where do we go next in the post-operative context? Uh, our interest lies in the arena of evaluating pre versus post-operative stereotactic radiosurgery. Based on some very intriguing data published in uh, 2016 by Patel and his colleagues, they looked at two different cohorts of patients, a total of 180 patients, uh, approximately 100 or so, 114 patients, had received post-operative stereotactic radiosurgery, and 66 had received pre-operative stereotactic radiosurgery. They looked at a couple of very intriguing endpoints that I'm going to share with you. The first endpoint is the iatrogenic failure rate or the so-called leptomeningeal failure rate as a consequence of surgical resection of these tumors, which are often resected piecemeal. These are not true R0 uh, extra capsular resections with intact tumor removal, but are often piecemeal removals of the tumor. So if one looks at leptomeningeal failure rates at two years, not just tumor bed failure rates, but actually uh, in and around the tumor bed in a leptomeningeal fashion, both pachymeningeal um, as well as uh, uh, leptomeningeal, the post-operative uh, post use of stereotactic radiosurgery yields a 17% LMD rate of failure. The pre-operative stereotactic radiosurgery approach dramatically decreases down to only 3%. So treating the lesion before it's removed potentially sterilizes the ability of microscopic disease to seed and relapse and recur wherever those tumor cells may be spread during the resection. And the p-value on that is an impressive 0 0.012. What was even more intriguing in this particular uh, evaluation was the impact on symptomatic radiation necrosis not just radiographic radiation necrosis, but symptomatic radiation necrosis. With the use of post-operative stereotactic radiosurgery, that rate at one year approaches 15% and is decreased tenfold, a log decrease with preoperative stereotactic radiosurgery to 1.5% with a p-value of 0 0.01. This is intuitively obvious. In the post-operative context, when we treat a target, normal brain has moved into what the surgical cavity was. So part of the target is normal brain and therefore it's not surprising that there's a tenfold higher rate of necrosis in these patients. So the question of pre versus post-op stereotactic radiosurgery remains open. It's not been tested in a prospective randomized trial. NRG Oncology is proposing such a randomized trial and we hope that that'll be launched very soon. I'm gonna shift gears and move to what I call smart combinatorial radiotherapy. Uh, and by this, what I mean is the combination of radiation with either targeted agents or immune checkpoint inhibitors. So let me set the stage for why I think this is an important uh, emerging trend or development that we should talk about. I'm gonna start by showing you um, data that uh, uh, are, this is a setup. So what I'm showing you here are 400 breast cancer patients with brain metastasis from an 11 institution database uh, that we published together with Paul Spaduto as the principal author on this paper in 2012. And as you can see, depending on the treatment arm, the survival goes up from 7.4 months with whole brain radiation to 29.5 months with whole brain radiation, stereotactic radiosurgery, and surgery. And clearly, as you can see on this slide, the more you do, the better the survival. So the lesson would be more aggressive management of brain metastasis produces better survival. So that was the setup. Here are the real data. What you can see here is in fact, survival is not a function of treatment. This is a recursive prognostic assessment tree and on this tree, you don't see survival anywhere as having an impact. Uh, you don't see treatment anywhere as having an impact on survival. 
So it is not the treatment that explains the differences in overall survival, but the distribution of prognostic variables. And the most significant prognostic variable impacting the outcome here is the HER2 nu status. Patients that are HER2 nu positive have a median survival of 26.8 months. Those that are negative have a median survival of 10.3 months. And the next most important factor is performance status. <clears throat> KPS of less than 50, the median survival is only 2.7 months. KPS of greater than 50, median survival is 10.6 months. So patient and tumor driven prognostic variables, especially molecular variables, seem to explain overall survival differences, not treatment. In this context, it's not just brain metastases from breast cancer that fit this model, but so do metastases from other diseases. This is another publication that we published in 2016, looking at molecular targeted expression in non-small cell lung cancer. And you can see multiple different survival curves on this slide. The best survival is in the ALK positive brain metastasis patients, 86 patients, brain metastasis from lung cancer, median survival, 45 months. That's a very impressive median survival number in a brain met population. However, in contrast, if you look at the green curve on this slide, which is the group of patients that have no specific expression of a targetable molecular marker, the median survival is only 14 months. The EGFR positive patients in blue also have a pretty good median survival of 23 months. So clearly the expression of targetable mutations dramatically shifts survival. Is this simply prognostic or is this a function of the therapy that these patients can receive as a consequence of the expression of the molecular markers? And in all likelihood, it's the fact that we now have blood-brain barrier penetrating targeted agents that control not just extracranial disease, but also intracranial disease. So if that is true, then perhaps we don't need to use radiation at all. The drugs are good enough. We should be using the drugs and that should be sufficient. The paper by Magnuson in the Journal of Clinical Oncology would say, hold your horses, don't jump to that conclusion. In this particular retrospective review of 350 odd patients with EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer, upfront stereotactic radio surgery or upfront whole brain radiotherapy added to EGFR tyrosine kinase receptor inhibitors shifted the overall survival significantly more than the use of drug alone. So if you look at the survival curve on the right hand side of this slide, the gold curve is drug alone, the gray curve is drug plus whole brain, the blue curve is drug plus radio surgery. So although the drugs are producing significant responses and potentially some survival benefit, withholding radiation may not be the right approach in this context. Well, what about immune checkpoint inhibitors? In melanoma, if you look on this table, the study published in the New England Journal in 2018 by Toby in 94 patients shows an intracranial response rate of almost 60%. It's 57% response rate in melanoma with drug alone. So if drug can produce a 60% response rate, why do we need radiation at all? Maybe the story with immune checkpoint inhibitors is different than the story with targeted agents. And I would say again, hold your horses. This is a publication that one of my colleagues, Rupesh Kotecha, published a year ago in Neuro-Oncology. This is a review of 150 patients from the Cleveland Clinic with more than 1,000 lesions that received radio surgery, but they had also received um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibition therapy. And what you can see is two different groups of patients, either those that received no immediate immunotherapy or those that did, and this was defined as within five half-lives of the drug half-life. So whether they got concomitant immune therapy and radiosurgery or not was the question. The upper blue arrow shows the rate of complete response. And by the way, the population made up in this group is lung cancer and melanoma for the most part, because these are the patients that are treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Clearly, the combination of the two 
immune therapy and radio surgery produces a significantly higher complete response rate. And if you look at the arrow at the bottom, which is the green plus blue arrow, which is a combination of partial and complete responses, that too is significantly larger and bigger with the addition of immunotherapy and radiosurgery together. So the combinatorial approach appears to produce a higher rate of responses at least. I'm now going to switch gears and talk about a theme that I had introduced earlier in the talk, and that was the theme of brain metastasis velocity. So let's first define this. What is brain metastasis velocity? Brain metastasis velocity can be defined, or at least was defined by Ferris and colleagues in 2017, as the number of new brain metastases appearing after the initial delivery of radiosurgery, divided by the interval in time since the initial stereotactic radiosurgery, the time interval is measured as uh, uh, time measured in years or a fraction thereof. And so based on the number of new mets that appear and when they appear, one can compute a brain metastasis velocity. And what they were able to show was if you reach a brain metastasis velocity of 13 or greater, uh, that's a very substantial, significant negative prognostic variable. But any increase in brain metastasis velocity is bad news, both in terms of subsequent failure in the brain, but also in terms of overall survival. So let's look at those data. So they first started off with what they call the derivation data set, which is image A in this slide on the left-hand side. And you see three survival curves based on brain metastasis velocity. The lowest brain metastasis velocity is less than four. The highest is more than 13. And each of these three curves separate very nicely, less than four, more than 13, between four and 13. Survival drops as brain metastasis velocity increases. So if you fail in the brain again and again, it's not just a matter of going again and again with radiosurgery and taking care of those lesions. Those patients are going to die faster as well. They validated this, as you can see in panel B on the right-hand side of this slide using a validation data set. And the curves are actually very, very similar. So unquestionably, brain metastasis velocity predicts overall survival. And they have now validated this with multiple other data sets that if you're interested, you can pull the papers that are listed on this particular slide. What's really intriguing to me is the fact that the way patients die when the brain metastasis velocity goes up is different. So if you look at patients whose brain metastasis velocity is less than four versus those that is say, for example, 13 or greater, there's a significantly higher incidence of neurologic death that drives the death in patients with higher brain metastasis velocity. Uh, in fact, neurologic death is threefold more likely in patients with high brain metastasis velocity compared to those with low brain metastasis velocity. This suggests that perhaps the death driven by neurologic death is driven by disease progression in the brain, which may not be a benign thing of saying, okay, I can treat your 13 meds, you relapse with another 10, I'll wait three months and treat you again, you relapse with another six, I'll wait three months and treat you again. There is a long-term price to be paid for this, and that is death driven by neurologic death. So if that's true, this could be a population that one could test that question. And in fact, the recently launched NRG trial BN009 will be asking that very question in a randomized context by taking patients at first or second distant relapse with high brain metastasis velocity defined as a BMV of greater than four, with appropriate stratification, they would be randomized to radiosurgery alone, which is the current standard of care. They relapse, we treat them with radiosurgery, or radiosurgery plus hippocampal avoidance and memantin to minimize the neurocognitive dysfunctional uh, impact of whole brain radiotherapy, with the primary endpoint in a phase two randomized setting of neurologic death and in the phase three setting of overall survival. So this trial has just been launched and will be an intriguing trial to see if this changes uh, practice patterns. I had mentioned to you earlier that part of what drives radiosurgery is now the integration and incorporation of artificial intelligence. And let me show you one example of this. This is a software program uh, that is actually now commercially available that uses AI-based planning 
for near instantaneous optimization of radio surgery. At the bottom, you see two images. On the left is a conventional radio surgery physicist slash physician planned image. The delivery time for this lesion was almost 83 minutes and the planner time was about two hours, 120 minutes. And it's a beautiful plan. Look at the yellow line that so nicely hugs the enhancing target and the rapid and quick drop off of the green isodose line uh, away from the tumor. This is a very, very good plan. Took the physicist two hours to plan it, took the, the gamma knife delivery time of almost 83 minutes. The same plan, planned by the artificial intelligence platform, almost looks superior. There's greater conformality, um, at least visually, and we analyze this numerically as well. And yes, there are slight improvements in the metrics for conformality. But what's really intriguing is the delivery time is almost halved from 83 to 50 minutes. But even more intriguingly, planner time goes from two hours to less than five minutes. So this could be a very dramatic impetus for promoting radio surgery. If you could plan in five minutes and deliver in under an hour, radio surgery now becomes like radiotherapy and you could treat 10, 12 patients a day on a dedicated radio surgery device which would be a dramatic cost-effective improvement in these technologies. So I'm gonna end here. I've covered a variety of different domains, advanced imaging, broader applicability of radio surgery, uh, smart combinatorial therapies. I did not specifically go into molecular guidance because I wanna leave some time for questions. So this is a good point for me to end. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see if there are any questions uh, in the chat box. If not, if any questions, uh, if anybody has questions, you can ask them now. This is a good time to pose your questions. Anish, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, you are the best speaker. So what a, a great overview of the field today. And uh, since I don't have a, no one's typed the question yet, I have a number just to get things started, but we don't even have that much time. So first I wanna say, uh, the, give not only a shout out to the AI driven uh, gamma knife treatment planning that you showed, but uh, just to let everyone know that uh, the current treatment planning system at ZAP looks analogous, if not better. So um, I think you're right. The, we're in an era now, it's gonna get easier, better and cheaper to treat uh, brain met patients, all, met, all metastasis with these AI like tools. So here's a, I'm gonna start with a question. I have several, but um, um, you, um, you point out that there's a diminishing survival benefit in patients with uh, high brain tumor velocities. Um, um, however, we sometimes see uh, patients with you know, numerous METs, they come back for several cycles, time after say three or four cycles, uh, 50, 60, 70 METs who sometimes almost end up being cured um, and go on for, if not cure, long, long-term survival. Um, is this, an enduring immunological response to the radio surgery? That's the question. Yes, that's a great question, John. So the way I look at this is the following. For me, it's not an either or scenario. It's not that you should not do radio surgery in patients with multiple metastases because you may not necessarily impact their survival. I don't look at it that way. The way I look at it is that we know that if we treat these patients with say whole brain radiotherapy, they're not going to get sufficient dose for durable long-term control of their metastatic disease. Whereas if we treat them with stereotactic radio surgery, whether it's in combination or alone, one gets improved local control. So that's a first step, that treating them with radio surgery is going to give us improved local control. Uh, whether you use whole radiotherapy, that's a separate clinical decision based on the specifics of the patient. But the addition of radio surgery does improve local control. And therefore it's worth doing that where feasible. Historically, people haven't done that in patients with 10, 15 or more metastases because it has been very challenging and very complicated, but technological advances today make that very feasible, very possible. The next question is, do some of these patients now also benefit from improved survival? And all of us have seen patients with numerous brain metastases that then go on to live for a longer period of time. What is different about these patients compared to the ones that don't derive 
uh, a long-term survival uh, outcome. One explanation could be that in fact, radio surgery triggers immune mechanisms that produce sustained disease control. And that is certainly a possibility. The preclinical models suggest that that is definitely possible. The preclinical models have been done using one or two or three radiation fractions. These are large fraction radiation analogous to what we do with stereotactic radiosurgery or fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy. And they do categorically show uh, sustained immune memory and even abscopal effect. The second possibility is that with the emergence of both immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy and mutations that can be targeted with specific mutation specific therapies, we are now beginning to get drugs that not only add to the local control benefit of radiation and radiosurgery, but potentially also have greater activity on microscopic disease. And therefore are slowing down the speed with which tumors disseminate in the brain and perhaps slowing down the natural history of progression in the brain. So I think it's probably a combination of those three variables, uh, mutation enriched tumors, mutation specific therapies, enhanced immune response and improved local control with uh, targeted radio surgery. Great response, great response. We have another question here, but I wanna, I wanna ask you one more question because you're a big thinker. And, um, and so you talked about uh, hippocampal sparing with uh, whole brain radiotherapy and the rationale being to uh, avoid irradiating uh, the periventricular germinal matrix stem cells. However, there's a lot of research done, and some of it, some of the best work coming out of Stanford that shows that radiation stimulates stem cell proliferation. And, and do we really know that radiation kills stem cells? Is there a chance that it, at the right dose does just the opposite? And uh, to what extent have you thought about this more broadly or not? Great question. So um, uh, Monica Monia and her colleagues have done a lot of this work, as you pointed out. And uh, there's clearly a dose effect. I think that in the therapeutic doses that we use in patients that get Holborn radiation, doses such as 30 grain, 10 fractions and thereabouts, um, the neurogenic stem cell niche is at risk of uh, being depleted by radiation. The stem cells are in fact killed off. We do know this. Now, the caveat here is that the rodent models on which these data are based are actually young rodents. And remember that for the vast majority of patients with brain metastasis, we are treating old patients. So there could be an age effect that we have not studied adequately, but be that as it may, the kind of doses that we are using are potentially harmful um, to hippocampal or perihippocampal stem cell compartments. However, at much lower doses, they could in fact be stimulatory and I'm going to actually digress to a completely different disease, Alzheimer's disease. Exactly, yep. In Alzheimer's disease, there are data both from preclinical models, as well as very modest, small clinical trials. There are two that I know of. One that's a multi-institution trial that's being done in the US. And a second is a Swiss trial that's currently ongoing in Europe. Both of these trials have enrolled patients and preliminary data are available from both trials that show that very low doses of radiation intriguingly appear to show better cognitive preservation in Alzheimer's patients. So it's a completely contradictory observation and it probably is explained by the fact that the dose levels are so different in these trials. Obviously the Alzheimer's data are based on very few patients, very preliminary, uh, and they're very intriguing and probably just underscore the hypothesis that it's not just all or none, that there is a dose effect. And wait till we biologically modify that response. Exactly. exactly. I could really go on all day. You and I would have a lot of fun here. And Patrick, I'm sorry I don't get to your question, but our hour has elapsed and uh, it was great fun, Manesh. Uh, you're, it was a brilliant, brilliant talk as always. Uh, I got to find a way to invite you back, okay? It was just tremendous. Pleasure. So thank you everybody for joining us and uh, Manesh, uh, tremendous. Really Thank good. you so much. Thank you, everybody. Okay, bye.